child. He was such a premature, wonderful uh, boy or girl, and parents have not lost a child. Uh, they think those parents tried to make a saint out of them, but they are, in a way, saints, mm -hmm. uh, if you don't take me too literally. Sure. They're very old and wise, like this curry that we saw in the previous interview. He has an incredible amount of wisdom. He didn't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. But when you hear the mother's poems and what mm -hmm. she shares, the language that this little boy uses is incredible. It's very profound. Yes. Normally you would hear that from a 90-year-old man from Kentucky or from, mm -hmm. from the mountains who has had a lot of time to contemplate about life. Mm -hmm. That to me is an incredible gift that parents should be aware of. So really you're making a helpful distinction that when you talk about the spiritual quadrant, uh, you're not talking about uh, something that's religious per se. You're really talking about a capacity that's more universal yes. and available to all human beings. Yeah, I believe that we are, in the most literal sense, a little piece of God, and that is our intuitive spiritual quadrant. Mm -hmm. And if you would be raised in a natural way, mm -hmm. not normal, which we do in our society, which is terribly unhealthy, Mm -hmm. But if we were raising our children with unconditional love and no spankings and punishment but firm, consistent discipline and hug them and touch them a lot and take care of their physical quadrant, in the first year of life, during the first and the sixth year, you develop your emotional quadrant. And if we could raise children again in a natural way, that means acknowledging our natural God-given emotions, mm -hmm. which include only two fears, the fear of falling and the fear of sudden loud noises. They're only natural fears. All other fears children have are given to them by their environment, by the grown-ups. The fearfulness of their parents or... The yeah, they project they their own fears. Uh, honey, don't cross the street, you're going to get killed. Mm -hmm. Don't be out in the dark, men are all bad and all that stuff. And they develop a next generation of phobic uh, children. Mm -hmm. uh, if we allow children to cry, and don't say, big boys, don't cry. And if you don't stop crying, I give you something to cry about. Uh, because if they're not allowed to deal with their thousand little deaths that mm -hmm. you have before you are going to school, like using your security blanket. I, if you're allowed to cry and you don't make a big fuss about it, they go on a tricycle and drive off and they're happy again. But if you punish them or belittle them or uh, tell them to shut up or I give you something to cry about, you repress a natural God-given gift to express grief with tears. That's mm -hmm. how we were created. Uh, if children were allowed to cry, they would never have oceans full of repressed grief. If they're allowed to be angry and say no mom without being bashed or spanked, mm -hmm. they wouldn't grow up having a Hitler inside of them. Mm -hmm. If they were allowed to be jealous and say, I'm going to read next year, and I'm going to learn how to play the flute like my brother. Uh, and especially if they would experience unconditional love. That's the most important thing. Then, at about age six, they develop an intellectual quadrant, and school would be a challenge and an adventure, not a threat. And only those children develop a spiritual quadrant that becomes visible and tangible in adolescence. And that comes very naturally. They begin to ask questions. Where do I come from? Where do I go? What is the purpose of life? Mm -hmm. That is spirituality. And they try to find answers to those questions. So the larger questions of meaning, uh, who am I, yes. where am I going, what's the meaning of my life? Right. Uh -huh. That is spirituality. That's what you mean by the spiritual. Yeah. And if you have a five-year-old or a six-year-old who has had a brain stem tumor or mm -hmm. leukemia or a potentially terminal illness, at age five they have all the inner knowledge mm -hmm. and all the inner wisdom. If you would ask them how long do you live, mm -hmm. are you going to live, they would not know because mm -hmm. that's a question from the intellectual quadrant to an intellectual quadrant. Mm -hmm. They don't understand the word brain tumor or cancer. Mm -hmm. But if you ask them to draw a picture, spontaneous picture, that is the language of your intuitive inner knowledge. And in that picture, maybe in the right lower quadrant, there are seven flowers with stems and leaves and the flower head. Mm -hmm. And the last picture has only a stem. Mm -hmm. And that child already tells you that during that year, that year will not be completed. And you can verify this. Mm 
in longitudinal mm -hmm. studies. From the intuitive, yes. the spiritual. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the beauty, and I think that's my main work, is to be a catalyst and a translator. When parents say my children don't know how sick they are, mm -hmm. and the brothers and sisters have no idea, that doesn't exist. The question is, can you hear mm -hmm. their language and their communication? Or like Corey, who does not want to talk about it right now, mm -hmm. that you respect that, that those children don't always want to talk about it. But there are times and places and people with whom they need to share it, and then they go on living again. That is, to me, the art of counseling parents of Certainly. dying children. So that we're really present when that moment comes, when right. the child or the dying person is willing right. to talk about it. That is love without expectation. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is the biggest issue when I'm asked about chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. In what way does that? For terminally old children. <coughs> there are parents who have a lot of ambivalence about chemotherapy or surgery or whatever treatment we give them, radiotherapy. And our tendency in medical school has been, I'm the expert, I tell you what is good for you. Mm -hmm. And from the intellectual point of view, that is very true. We physicians know more about the treatment potentials and the prognosis than anybody else. I, I acknowledge that. What we have ignored until the last 10, 12 years is that the patient knows more than any of us know. The question is, how can I elicit your inner knowledge mm -hmm. and be humble enough to accept that you actually know more about your body than I do? I have statistical knowledge, mm -hmm. a knowledge from collecting a lot of cases from other patients, but you may be an exception. Mm -hmm. or you may not be uh, in favor and may, for religious or moral or whatever reasons, reject mm -hmm. the idea of chemotherapy. How do I, as a physician, know what is good for you, not what is good statistically for the majority of people. And how do I react when you say, no, thank you, doctor? Mm -hmm. That, I think, is a big issue. And my greatest uh, pleasure in this work has been to modify the method of interpretation of drawings with dying children and their siblings and moms and dads and grandparents, is to ask a patient, conceive of your cancer. Mm -hmm. And they draw a person with whatever cancer means to them. And then I ask them, conceive of chemotherapy, conceive of surgery, conceive of radiotherapy, or whatever the alternatives are. And I always include non-acceptable treatments. Mm -hmm. And I say that in quotes, because... Mm -hmm. Non-acceptable be to them? No, non-acceptable to the science of medicine. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. uh, until recently. Mm -hmm. Like visualization, healing, uh, acupuncture, mm -hmm. whatever, anything that is conceivable, mm -hmm. that would be one of the choices that this patient would have, I include in that. And all I want is the patient to number the pictures so I don't know which is which. And then I could show it to a panel of physicians who know interpretation of drawings. And in 10 minutes you know what this patient internally, not here, knows what is going to help them. And I think if we are humble enough to just accept that human beings know a lot more than they know up here, mm -hmm. and that we begin to use those methods, we could reduce maybe surgery by 50% and not waste enough too much time on a form of therapy which the patient internally rejects. Mm -hmm. So you're really talking about something that's far deeper than the patient's uh, values about whether they want uh, chemotherapy or not. You're really talking about their own inner wisdom about their own body. It's their own spiritual quadrant mm -hmm. that has all knowledge. Mm -hmm. That is the knowledge that tells me how much a five-year-old knows mm -hmm. about his own life expectation. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is an incredible gift. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to show you an sure. example, like if you don't that. mind. Mm -hmm. uh, although this is from a grown-up, I think it is my favorite example, it was a 40-year-old man who was asked to conceive of his cancer, and he drew a man, I'm only drawing a big belly now, and the whole big belly was filled with concentric circles, bright red concentric circles, and red is always a stop signal and a warning signal 
and also expresses anger and something that you really should deal with. So what he really said in a non-verbal symbolic language is my whole body is full of these dangerous red cancer cells. And I asked him, his physician recommended chemotherapy. And from a purely statistical scientific point of view, this man had a good chance to respond to chemotherapy. So I asked him to conceive of the chemotherapy. And this man drew black arrows, and every arrow hit a cancer cell. But the interesting thing about his picture was that every arrow touched the cancer cell, instead of destroying it, deflected away from it. You don't know much about the interpretation of drawings, but knowing very little, I can would see you regard that. this as a good candidate for chemotherapy? I wouldn't think so. If you have any belief, about this spiritual, intuitive inner knowledge that all human beings have, you would at least stop and say, wait a minute, there is something not right, and you would probably be very leery, or hopefully mm -hmm. be very leery, to put this man on chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. My question to this man would be, what did your doctor tell you about the chemotherapy? And this man very spontaneously said, my doctor told me the chemotherapy kills my cancer cells. And I naturally, being a physician, wanting my patients to get well, I said yes. And my yes alone implied, go and get it. Mm -hmm. And this man's face dropped. And then I stopped and I said, what did he tell you about the chemotherapy? Like I knew I missed something, but up here I didn't know what. And he said, my doctor told me the chemotherapy kills my cancer cells. And I said, yes, but? And then he looked at me, and I think that's the most important moment between a physician and a patient. He looked at me like, can I trust her? Mm -hmm. Or is she going to laugh at me? Is she going to be judgmental? And I looked him straight in the eyes, and he said, thou shalt not kill. And I said, huh? Oh, meaning that goes a bit too far. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, cancer kill those cells. cancer cells. And he was almost apologetic and said, I was raised as a Quaker. I was raised in believing in universal laws, thou shalt not kill, and it's just inconceivable for me to kill any part of me. I can't even kill my cancer cells. If I'm judgmental and I feel threatened by this man, not being a good patient to gratify my needs, to treat him with my beloved chemotherapy, mm -hmm. which I'm acting this role now, that's not how I feel, but that's... Mm -hmm. Uh, then I would laugh at him and say, that's ridiculous. I told him that it would be wonderful if everybody would believe in the universal laws, thou shalt not kill. The world would be a beautiful place. But then I had to add, and I said, I have needs too, I'm a physician. And I want you to do something for me. Go home and conceive how you can get rid of your cancer cells. Do, do you hear the difference? You can get rid of somebody, you don't have to kill them. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'll think about it. And a week later, same man comes back. I don't want his head answers. I don't want to know what he thought about. I want to know if he's really inside able to conceive. So I asked him to draw a picture, and he draws a picture. The whole body was now full of gnomes. You know what the gnomes are? Mm -hmm. Those little guys that look as cute as E.T. Uh -huh. And every gnome, and the whole body was full of them, I'm only drawing one. And the whole body, all the gnomes, lovingly carried the cancer cell away. I was so touched, I almost cried. I called up his oncologist and said, he's okay now. You can put him on chemotherapy. That, to me, is holistic medicine. And if you can do that with the critically ill children or children we are going to put on chemotherapy, which they may reject, or it may kill them, mm -hmm. rather than the tumor kills them. We would know those things ahead of time. That, to me, is how we have to train physicians of the future to use additional tools which they may think is not scientific, but they can verify this with thousands of cases. Mm -hmm. And that, that's one of the courses I would like to have taught in medical school, how to learn the interpretation of spontaneous drawings. So uh, your hope for the future is that physicians and other health professionals can 
learn to be sensitive to the yes. spiritual quadrant of their patients, to yeah. be able to listen yeah. more deeply to the needs. And to the language of the spiritual quadrant, which mm -hmm. is all knowledge, mm -hmm. all of it, far more than any of us. Mm -hmm. Because the intellectual knowledge is the most superficial part of the human being. Mm -hmm. And that's a uh, hypertrophic in most of us because we're trained to cure to treat to prolong life mm -hmm. but we are not trained enough to acknowledge that patients know inside what's going on inside their body okay it it uh, it seems at times that there's a paradox in in medicine that is the goal of medicine is often to cure the patient to prolong their life to bring the technologies of uh, our scientific investigation to bear on the troubles of the person. And sometimes that can be a very wholehearted commitment, uh, a kind of monistic theme for the healthcare professional. And yet there comes a time when such therapies are of no avail and a patient clearly is dying, and that means to really turn the corner to, to accept something other than the curative, to, <coughs> to accept death. If I had a child that needed heart surgery, I would take the best heart surgeon in the world and I'd be very grateful for every monitor and respirator and surgical knife and mm -hmm. anything and everything. Because after heart surgery, this child may have a good chance to live a full functioning life and I'm very grateful for mm -hmm. that kind of medicine. Uh, if I have a child who has a malignancy and we have tried the conventional treatments, and this child appears to me as saying no thank you, I would ask this child directly, or in a symbolic language, and if this child says no thank you, mm -hmm. I would hope that we can love those children unconditionally and not do things to them to gratify our needs mm -hmm. and have them spend maybe the last few months in a hospital under horrible treatments when they tell you loud and clearly, mm -hmm. I want to go home and I want to enjoy the last few weeks of my life. Mm -hmm. And this method, I think, is a bridge for those who feel that's not okay and for those who really want it badly. Because you can check it out and verify it and you know that those children are right. I should have asked you to bring some of the drawings today that uh, yeah. might have helped us to yeah. illustrate that. Yeah. How do you look upon uh, some of the cases that receive uh, national publicity? Recently, there was a case of a, a young girl in Tennessee whose parents refused uh, life-saving chemotherapy for her. And uh, somewhat earlier, there was a, a case where the court mandated treatment and the parents took their child to Mexico to, to seek laetrile treatments rather than to undergo chemotherapy. I think it's criminal for a uh external source to tell parents what they can do with the child. I, I would be appalled mm -hmm. that the court has the right to take a child away from parents and demand a mm -hmm. treatment that the parents uh, cannot accept. Mm -hmm. I think that's ex extremely the, uh, uh, intrusive, uh, intrusive uh, and, yeah. and deprives you of a total freedom in in a country that is, prides itself of freedom, I think mm -hmm. that's horrible. Sometimes this case occurs with parents who are members of the Jehovah's Witness religion and uh, their child needs a blood transfusion to save its life. Uh, free, do you make a distinction? Free choice, mm -hmm. to me, is mm -hmm. the greatest gift that God gave to man. Mm -hmm. And for any human being to deprive you of free choice is the biggest criminal act that I can imagine. Mm -hmm. If children are raised in the religious families that do not allow that, uh, that is the right of the family mm -hmm. to say no thank you. Mm -hmm. And they also have to accept the consequences of all their choices. They cannot blame the hospital or the doctors, but you do not take a child away and force chemotherapy on a child if the parents say no thank you. Mm -hmm. That to me is, is incomprehensible. What about, just to push that a little bit, uh, <coughs> uh, 
could that not be seen perhaps as a conflict between the freedom of choice of the parent and the freedom of choice of the youngster who really is not powerful enough to say they want to live or they would like to have the opportunity to live. Is there sometimes a conflict then between whose rights are going I to I guess be? my own spiritual beliefs uh, go far beyond that. And oh. I believe that every child picks their parents, knows what is in store in life and what they have to contribute to mankind. Mm -hmm. And those children wouldn't have picked Jehovah Witnesses' parents knowing that they're coming down with these problems if that would not fulfill their own purpose. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that totally. I so I cannot argue on an intellectual sure. level with okay. you. That gives a, a larger context yes. to what you're I understand saying. your arguments, uh -huh. but I cannot really honestly uh, believe that. Surely. I think a child who gets leukemia at age one and dies at age seven, knew before he was born that he's going to go through a very difficult time. And there's a gift that he contributes to mankind. Mm -hmm. a, a couple who has grown closer together and has grown enormously in unconditional love and compassion and understanding, mm -hmm. maybe becomes the founder of compassionate friends mm -hmm. and affects maybe a million people. And this little guy only lived seven years and was sick six years out of the seven years, but his life is not meaningless mm -hmm. because he knows how many lives he's going to affect by this short span of life. I believe that. Uh -huh. And it strikes me that in many ways the theme that you've addressed yourself to in your work has been to help people as they experience the tragic in their life to make some sense out of it and to... I have always seen, and I'm working with a lot of tragedies, mm -hmm. like we had 10,000 parents of murdered children. Mm -hmm. Suicide among children is enormous, mm -hmm. a third cause of death between children between age 6 and 16. I've had three parents now, single parents, who have had lost three children mm. by suicide. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's enormous, a, a horrible uh, kind of a destiny, I almost want to say. And I've seen that if they're allowed to cry and if they get the shoulder to lean on, mm -hmm. if they're allowed to express their impotent rage and questioning God and whatever comes, whether it sounds ladylike or not, if they're allowed to, to share their pain, their anguish, their rage, their grief, and have a support system, even if it's only two people, uh, they come out of it. It's like when you put the rock in a tumbler. Your choice, and it is your choice, whether you come out crashed or polished. Mm -hmm. I see the ones who come out polished, mm -hmm. who, who are incredible contributors uh, to helping other families who have suicide, other families who lose a child suddenly. The organization Parents of Murdered Children mm -hmm. came out of the anguish and agony of parents who had a child murdered. And I think if you look at anything in, in history uh, that was horrible, also look at the whole tragedy in context and see all the things that came out of that. I mean, I had to see the concentration camp of Maidanek mm -hmm. and the butterflies that those children scratched into the wooden barrack walls to open my eyes what I have to do with my life. I'm not saying that the Maidanek was created for me to get into this work, I mm -hmm. hope you hear that. Yes. But you can stand in front of a concentration camp where 960,000 children have been murdered, and you can become bitter and hate the Nazis and spread seeds of hate. Mm -hmm. Or you can say, I want to do my little contribution uh, to change life for the next generation that we don't have another Buchenwald or Auschwitz or whatever. And parents who have gone through nightmares, through having a child die, whether it's a malignancy or whether it's a suicide or a murder, if they're allowed to express their, their negativity, their, their anguish, they grow enormously and they use then their, their growth, their wisdom, their love, their compassion, their understanding to touch other lives. You have spoken before about death as the final stage of, of growth. Is, is that kind of what you meant by that 
idea that a person in the midst of this tragedy uh, may be asking, why did this happen to me, or why did God allow this to happen to if me? You, if you ask in the midst of the tragedy, I hope that nobody will have the arrogance to answer such mm -hmm. a question, because you don't know that. Surely. But what you encourage them to do is to just express their impotent rage at mm -hmm. God or whatever. And then later, 10 years, 20 years later, you see them again and say, look back, how has this changed your life? Mm -hmm. Oh, God, is like that night. Mm -hmm. the, the growing and the learning continues after death. I want to say naturally, but I'm talking to a minister, so I have to be careful. <laughs> there is a, a continuous growth, the physical life is the hardest because we're so limited in our in our knowledge mm -hmm. but once you make it through the physical life it doesn't mean that life ends or growth this continues it's a continuous growth surely uh, i'd like to come back to that later but let me just pick up on a comment you made earlier um, i think that a lot of times ministers uh, chaplains and sometimes doctors and nurses get hooked when the patient asks the question why did this happen to me as though they're looking for an immediate answer to that question and you've kind of warned us here that it's arrogant on our part to try to answer that the worst thing a minister can say it was mm -hmm. god's will mm -hmm. Boy, I, I agree completely if i was a mother mm -hmm. there'd be many ministers who wouldn't have any teeth that's right <laughs> I'd <be> so angry. <laughs> yeah. that's right that would be a, a terrible god who would will that for yes, us yes yes and god is all love i concur okay. um but you're suggesting that what we need to help professionals see is their need to stand or to or to sit with that see, person you, and allow them to yeah. express their rage. The problem with healthcare professionals, uh, the problem with people of re not really being trained in this work, is not that they don't have the right answers. So mm -hmm. they haven't read enough books. They've read too many books. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem is that their own unfinished business interferes, and if you do not feel inside okay that it's okay that any of us can die any time uh, if you feel an impotent rage in the face of a mother who just lost all her children or whatever how can you help that person mm -hmm. then either you, your rage uh, blocks you or you're saying things that you really that are not helpful to the mm -hmm. parents the biggest most important thing is that the health caregivers is always in touch with their own unshed tears, unexpressed rage, fear of impotence or whatever you have. And if you clean your own garden of your own weeds, then the parent sees the flowers in your garden and mm -hmm. not your own weeds. Mm -hmm. This is why psychiatrists have the highest rate of suicide in, in the country, because they have listened all day long to other people's problems. Mm -hmm. Many of them push their own buttons. Mm -hmm. Well, they can't say, well, that's my problem too. And they're supposed to have the answers and mm -hmm. help them. So they keep the lid on. And if you keep the lid on long enough, sooner or later, it's just going to explode. And they have no support system where the healer gets some healing. Mm -hmm. They have no place where they can let go and rage and cry and and let their their things come out and that's why so many healthcare professionals have inc incredible high rate of suicide intensive care nurses mm -hmm. have to call in sick when they're not sick what they're saying to you by calling in sick is i can't take I one can't more take death anymore, yeah. i can't take one more mm -hmm. this and that and if we had screaming rooms mm -hmm. in our hospitals isolated soundproof rooms where you can go in and swing a hose and let it out. Your sense of frustration, of impotence, of sadness, whatever. And then you can come out again and then you're okay. Then you're able to hear your patients. It's a marvelous help. But that takes, again, humility that's too primitive and that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. well, no. I was going to say, even if we had the, the uh, screaming rooms, a lot of people are so culturally conditioned to kind of bottle up their feelings that they may not uh, really oh, be able to use. Oh, they may be forceps deliveries, but they come anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I just had two workshops in England, and I thought, God, I'll never survive them. Yeah. And on the third day, boy, you should have heard those very stiff, formal 
British people, they took their ties off and their jacket, mm -hmm. and boy, did they get it out. Mm -hmm. And they felt like a million dollars mm -hmm. after it. In a hospital, you get the, the ward clerks mm -hmm. first, because they get it from everybody. They're mm -hmm. very forgotten people. And the nurses aid and the nurses. Then the hospital chaplains join, then the externs, then the interns. And if you're lucky, you get one or two residents. Uh -huh. But, but they are coming and sharing. And when a nurse sees a physician do it, you have no idea how the respect goes up. Mm -hmm. And the mutual humanness that they share, it's mm -hmm. very beautiful. It would really enhance the teamwork instead of judging and criticizing each other. Well, he never tells his patients that mm -hmm. we have cancer and we are stuck. And all that latent hostility that you see in many hospitals would disappear mm -hmm. if they would share their own humanness and their own grief and their own pain. So one of the things that um, one of the things that people who work with the dying often complain about is that sense of, of burnout. Uh, they oh, just, I like that. You like word. that term? That doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Burnout gonna... means too many people pushed my buttons and I either didn't acknowledge that it's my own unfinished business or I didn't give myself permission to get mm -hmm. rid of my unfinished business. Mm -hmm. I'm too busy. Mm -hmm. And if you go home and let it out, you cannot be burned mm -hmm. out. So I it work really 17 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. I get tired, I see lots of tragedies. Mm -hmm. But when you have not too much unfinished business, I mean, all of us have some. Sure. But if you don't have too much, you cannot get drained. Mm -hmm. And you cannot get depressed. Mm -hmm. And you will discover some marvelous universal laws, like that you're always given what you need. Mm -hmm. And that includes energy, if you use it, you know, to help mm -hmm. somebody. How do you get in touch with uh, your own unfinished business? What, what, what have you learned? I gave that, an that AIDS workshop you... yesterday or two days ago. And I came in with all my enthusiasm. We're finally going to do something for this really rejected group of people. This is, this is for AIDS patients? AIDS patients. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. And there are like 38 patients, some of them <coughs> lie on the floor and can barely move, and some of them really look horrible and mm -hmm. ugly and grotesque and repulsive, and some of them look like gorgeous, strong, healthy, manly men, and the whole group of these people together. And I'm walking in full of enthusiasm, I'm really going to push their buttons and get it out so they have their energy left to fight this disease. Mm -hmm. And instead of that, everybody's quiet and said, before you can see anything, we want to know your attitude about homosexuals. Nice. Boom. And I couldn't give them a diplomatic answer. And I couldn't give them a polite answer. And I couldn't even give them an answer they like to hear. Mm -hmm. And the turmoil, you know, that now you always push other people's buttons. <laughs> now they pushed mine. And so I had uh -huh. to be very, very honest mm -hmm. and accept the consequences of my honest sharing with mm -hmm. them. And after the workshop, I had to go and work on that. Where does mm -hmm. this very judgmental, opinionated opinion come from? Mm -hmm. And that's an example. Mm -hmm. Anytime I react to anybody more than 15 seconds, I know they push my own buttons mm -hmm. and I have to work on it. And I spent four nights out of five in motel rooms, and they're not good screaming rooms, mm -hmm. you understand? Mm -hmm. So like now I'm not home for two weeks, that means I have to put it in a drawer. Mm -hmm. And then when I come home, I'll come back work it out before I go on the road again. Mm -hmm. Otherwise I would never make my schedule. So you're kind of, you're coaching us uh, to the notion that if we really pay attention to ourselves, if we really listen to what yeah. our reactions are yeah. to the people with whom we work. Especially people who make you mad. People who make us mad. You should bless them. Mm -hmm. Because they cross your path to help you to become whole. We can go look at that and find out what is there in me that's unresolved. That yeah. If they push your button about something, that means it's something in you that you don't like. Mm -hmm. Or something that you experience in your childhood that you reacted to. Mm -hmm. Anytime you react negatively, it helps you diagnose your own unfinished business. If we pay attention to it. Yeah. 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 Um, going back to your other point, then you said um, <coughs> you look at life as a, a continuum, and that uh, you look at at uh, 
life beyond death as an opportunity for continued growth. Uh, maybe you could help me understand your your feelings. I can or... use a children's language if, if sure. uh, parents ask me what happens mm -hmm. to children at the moment of death. Uh, we use uh, the children's uh, language that I learned in a concentration camp and I use this, the butterfly as a symbol. That our physical body is only a cocoon and when this physical body uh, gets damaged beyond repair, it simply releases the butterfly. And that's the real you. Mm -hmm. What you see now, that's my cocoon. Mm -hmm. That can be ugly or damaged or sick or fat or short and it's terribly, it doesn't matter. The real you is this. Mm -hmm. And when you die at the moment of death, uh, you need, in order to function, you need consciousness. And consciousness needs a functioning brain. And it's very important that people use the correct language because otherwise it becomes very flaky. Uh, when you leave your physical body, and children before death leave their physical bodies very often, that's why shortly before death they are not, not afraid of death. They also know who waits for them because very often they leave the body before actual death occurs. They often send mommies home and say, go home and take a shower and take a rest. You look very tired, I'm really okay now. And they're terribly okay, but not the way we want to hear it. And then when mommy has had a rest and a shower, the phone call comes, I'm sorry, Susie died. And those mothers pull their hair out that they didn't sit for another hour. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand that Susie sent mommy home because once you're out of your body, Susie can think of mommy or daddy and at the speed of her thought, she's with mommy and daddy. And the children know that. They know it here, not necessarily mm -hmm. here again. Mm -hmm. uh, when they leave their physical body, they have all awareness. And that does not require a functioning brain. And that is true when you have a flat EG. Mm -hmm. This is physical energy. This is psychic energy. And this is spiritual energy. And man, thank God, can only manipulate physical and psychic energy. And because man has been given free choice, both can be positive or negative. Once you're here, it can only be positive. Negativity does not exist in God. Mm -hmm. That's all unconditional love. And that's very important to know when you hear of people who see Satan, for example. Mm -hmm. That is real, but not reality. It's like in a dream. You talk to somebody, mm -hmm. and that's very real for you, but it's not reality. Not reality. Mm -hmm. When you are in this stage, you will be whole again. Children who lose their hair tell me they have their hair again. My people in wheelchairs can dance again. Mm -hmm. uh, this is always perfect and more perfect and more beautiful than a cocoon. And here you begin to realize that no human being can die alone. Because the person who left the body, they may not be dead yet can be near-death experience, can be anywhere at the speed of their thought. So parents who have lost a child in an avalanche or in a car accident, they are so traumatized that they were not with the child at the moment not of physically death. physically present. Physically not able to hold or mm -hmm. hug or console them. They don't ever have to worry about that because the child was with them even if they lived 10,000 miles away. And pe people need to know that, mm -hmm. I think. And here you also meet the ones who preceded you in death. A grandma, a grandpa, a brother, sister, or whoever. We verify that, and I hope that more medical students who don't believe a word I say now, mm -hmm. uh, go and verify that if they need to have that verified. We took uh, children who had family members die in a car accident, in head-on family collisions. And they are not told who was killed at the scene of the accident because they're in a coma or critically injured or with burn wounds and mm -hmm. they're sent to hospital. Uh, weeks and months later when they are very near death and there is a kind of a change of behavior at that time, like if they've been in a coma, they may come out of a coma or if they've had pain, they're pain free. And a lot of people think they're gonna make it. But good nurses and physicians know that that's the peace before death. And at that time, I sit with them, and if I can, I touch them. 
And I said, can you share with me what you experienced? And you'll hear it a thousand times. They say, everything is okay now. Mommy and Peter are already waiting for me. In 13 years, I've never had a child who mentioned a family member who did not precede them in death by at least 10 minutes. Is that right? And statistically, that is impossible mm -hmm. if that is not reality. Mm -hmm. Once you've had the reunion with the ones you love the most, they're very often religious figures, Jesus or Mary if it's a Catholic child. Mm -hmm. You always see the ones you love the most first. Once you've met whoever you need to meet to know that life continues and that death does not exist, that takes your last fear of death away. Mm -hmm. Then you go through a tunnel or a bridge or a gate, depending on your cultural, religious background, and you will see a light. And that is spiritual energy, and people call that God or Christ or love or light mm -hmm. or depending. Once you've had a glimpse of that light, you'll never, ever, ever be afraid of death. It's the most glorious experience human beings can never describe. If it's a near-death experience, you have to go back. Mm -hmm. But your life will be changed because you know. You don't just believe. Mm -hmm. You know now. If you die, this connection between a cocoon and a butterfly is up. And that's really, in the future, I'm sure, the definition of death. We hope to photograph that now. So we do no longer have to need to prolong life on a corpse, mm -hmm. you know, who's really not mm -hmm. living anymore. Once you're here, you, in the presence of this light, you will experience what man's potential is, what we could be like, if we would listen. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all unconditional love and compassion and understanding. And it's in this presence of this light that you will have not, no longer all awareness, no more consciousness, but all knowledge. See, and it's a piece of that that gives you the spiritual quadrant, and you then go back to this. And that's why children know. It's the briefest way I can de Surely. describe mm -hmm. it. And it sounds like you're saying this has been confirmed so many times in your experience by the people who've had near-death experiences. And not just number-wise. We, mm -hmm. we studied people. Uh, we had an Indian woman who was on the highway, mm -hmm. killed by a hit-and-run driver, and the man stopped, didn't know her. She was critically injured. Mm -hmm. And she asked him to go to the Indian reservation one day and give her mother a message. Mm -hmm. And the message was, tell her that I was okay, that I was already with my dad. And then she died in the arms of the stranger. And this man was so touched by being at the right place at the right time that he drove 700 miles out of his way when the Indian woman told him that her husband died one hour before the car accident, 700 miles away. I mean, you can collect cases mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. If you are a <coughs> classical, non-believing, not spiritually evolved mm -hmm. scientist, you call it hogwash. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really matter because I don't think we are here to convince or convert anybody. Mm -hmm. I know, and once they make the transition, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to watch <laughs> them. And I'm going to use symbolic nonverbal language. <laughs> I, I think our job, in science especially, mm -hmm. is not to need to convince other people, mm -hmm. but that we are willing to stick our neck out and share what we know. Mm -hmm. And if you're not ready, you will say it's oxygen deprivation mm -hmm. or some other rational kind of thing. And hopefully, eventually, by the time you die, you will know. Mm -hmm. The beauty about it is that my youngest child who shared this with me was a two-year-old child. Mm -hmm. And they have not read Moody's book. And they have not read Reader's Digest. <laughs> you know, and they have not been contaminated. Mm -hmm. And I think if you get this data from very young children, mm -hmm from aboriginals, Eskimos, Christians, Jews, Muslims. I mean, there must be something mm -hmm. true about it. That it's a universal phenomenon. It's totally it's not, universal. It's not Buddhist or it's not no. Christian or Jewish. It's There's only one God. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm convinced of that. Mm -hmm. And we're all brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice if dying children could teach the world that we're all brothers and sisters. A great lesson for all yeah. of us. I hope so. 
And as you spoke about your concept of God as, as unconditional love, and I take it that you're saying your goal as a person is to be more unconditionally loving. That's the only goal and, in life that anybody That's for all have. of us the lesson. Yeah. When, you, when you're near, when you're in the presence of this love, uh, you're not only asked in an implicit way, what have you done with your life? But you suddenly begin to see that your total life is nothing else but every choice you have taken, every moment of your life, and all its consequences. Like if you grow up, if you wake up this morning a sourpuss, and you're nursed with your kids and your wife, it will literally touch a hundred or a thousand people. Your own sourpuss makes other people crouch and kick the dog and mm -hmm. hit the brother, and the brother hits his friend, and the friend goes to school and makes the teacher mad. The teacher lets it out on her husband and sends your kid to the principal and he comes home with a letter and it has an incredible ripple effect of negativity. Mm -hmm. If tomorrow you're still a sourpuss, but you acknowledge that, mm -hmm. and you put the music on and some coffee and hug your mate and kiss your children to school and then close the door and then you can beat the living hell out of the mattress. <laughs> and get rid of your mad mm -hmm. and anger. But it. your children and your husband or wife, they come back in the evening, they're different people. Mm -hmm. You should check how one five-minute behavior affects other people. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. And after death, you will know every word, every thought, and every deed, mm -hmm. and all its consequences. To me, literally, mm -hmm. and not, not, uh, not literally, Symbolically speaking, that is going through hell. To know how much help we had, how much love we got, and how we, we didn't listen. Mm -hmm. And what it could have been if we just tried a little harder to love unconditionally. There's an Old Testament scripture that says the parents have eaten grapes and their children's teeth are set on edge. And I think you've given me a, a new way to help interpret that, the effects of our negativity or conversely, it's, it's enormous. Of, uh, if 10,000 people for 24 hours would love unconditionally, I think it would change the whole surface of the earth. Mm -hmm. it, love is always stronger than any negativity. Mm -hmm. And you learn that from dying children. So in many ways, children in particular have been your teachers. Yes, especially terminal children, because they have developed this spiritual quadrant of knowledge and they are not full of baloney, and they're not worried what you think if they say this and that. Mm -hmm. And they share that with you from the bottom of their soul. Mm -hmm. And you sit and listen, and you feel very blessed that you can be in this work. Mm -hmm. It's much less, a lot of people think it's depressing to work with dying children all the time. They don't know what they're missing. They're incredible teachers. I have even the feeling that many of them are sent to be our teachers. Mm -hmm. And they teach parents to love, and then they can graduate and go back home. I see death as a graduation, by the way. As a graduation? Yeah. You want to say a little more about that? I think all of us have to learn certain major and certain minor, using American language. Okay. And uh, when you've learned your lessons and passed your tests, you're allowed to go back home. So if, if we hang around a long time, it may be uh, we have a lot to learn. slow <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, No, we need old people badly because I think the old people in our society are the only people left who can give our children unconditional love. Mm -hmm. And an old grandma with a wrinkled face and a grandpa can be the biggest gift on earth to a little child, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. My big dream is to have nursing homes where all the Toddlers of working parents stay with the old people during the day and they will be touched and hugged and loved again. And the children can be spoiled and experience unconditional love. There's something in it for both of them. Yeah. Spoiling does not mean to buy them toys. Mm -hmm. Spoiling means to sit and listen to them and be with them and hold them and hug them even if they have a green and yellow runny nose. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that kind of love. Surely to yeah. be to be yeah. truly present yeah. to them. Do, do you mind if I ask you to read this poem that the mother of the little boy we saw a few minutes ago wrote, and that's the reflection of the thoughts of this little boy? And well, I think it's... Do you want me to read this? Yeah, if you don't mind. Sure. 
It reflects through the mother's words the wisdom of a little boy who has had leukemia for several years. She's called this the freedom of flight. Don't weep for me when I've gone away. Death is not like the end of the play. It's like the freedom of the butterfly's first flight. I won't really be gone, only from sight. All the love that I brought here with me from birth will always be with you while you are on earth. I will be back in God's loving embrace. So please wipe those tears of sadness off your face. Be happy I'm free from pain and despair, free like the birds that soar through the air. I will always be with you in everything you see, wherever you look, will remind you of me. A flower in bloom, a new bud on a tree, and even a dandelion growing in the lawn. But please don't think of me as gone. A kid's game of soccer, a familiar song you will hear, comic books, cartoons, and danger, my favorite bear. Don't think of death as the end of me. It's just the beginning of my flight to be free. Don't mourn my passing because I will be as one with God, all knowingness and light. I will dance on the stars that shine in the night or glide like a leaf caught in a gentle breeze or soar on the wind with the bird's grace and ease. Maybe hitch a ride on the tail of a kite, all with the magic and freedom of a butterfly's first flight. It's beautiful. That's what I hear day after day. From your children? Yeah. Your teachers? Yeah. Elizabeth, I feel very gifted to be in your presence for this hour. and Thank you. I'm grateful that medical school allowed us to do taping here. Thank you. And I think the message you have uh, shared with me today will be one that will be shared with health professionals and pastors and chaplains and will be part of the magnification of that positive ripple effect you're talking and about. And my children will thank you for it. <laughs>